Well, good evening, everybody. A warm welcome to this Audit and Government Committee meeting tonight. Um, right, our first item on the agenda is any apologies? We have, apolo we have apologies from Councillor Richard Kingston and Councillor Sarah Daniels, who might be arriving a little late. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, minutes of the previous meeting, which I know have been circulated. So I'd like to, uh, any, any amendments, any corrections? I'd like to move them. Seconder? That's good. And can we have a vote? Thank you very much. Uh, item number three, declaration of interest. Are there any? Okay, moving swiftly on. Our next item is the audit findings and report of the management presentation letter. And that's in the hands of... Thank you, Chair. Uh, so as the name suggests, this report summarises our findings from the 21-22 audit of the financial statements. Um, it is only the financial statements work at the moment. We've not yet finished our work on the council's arrangements to secure value for money, uh, but we're aiming to finalise that over the next couple of months and bring that um, to the committee in the early new year. Um, so in terms of the key messages, we are not yet in a position to sign the opinion on the financial statements, but we are very close. Um, the main findings from our point of view are set out in this report. Um, there's effectively two. So we have identified some issues on the valuation of the council's dwellings um, as a result of the value of basing their valuation on incorrect information and, and miscategorizing some of those some of those dwellings. Um, this did cause us some delays in sort of auditing the balance and getting to that final position was quite an iterative process, uh, but it has resulted in a relatively small adjustment in the in the scale of the dwellings valuation, um, increasing that by just over half a million pounds. Uh, and the other the other issue that we're still working through at the moment is on the valuation of the pension liability where we have identified a difference between the assumption that the pension funds actuary has used uh, relating to future increases in salaries and the assumption that our expert has told us we should expect um, so we're just working through that we think the difference is relatively minor we're not expecting it to cause any material issues in the accounts we just need a bit more of an explanation from the actuary as to why what they've done is appropriate so that we can just bottom that out um, there are a few other sort of disclosure changes but nothing else that's particularly major um, page three of the report does list a number of items outstanding most of which have moved on um, since then so as i've previously said we're awaiting an explanation from the pension fund actuary around that salary increase assumption um, we have now received all the information we need on the valuation of other land and buildings so we're just working through the final bits of that um, we are still working through the valuations of the investment properties and there might be a couple more questions coming out there but we're not expecting anything major um, we've received responses from the council in relation to the outstanding items on creditors, so that's pretty much there. Um, and we, we are still awaiting evidence relating to the sort of timing of the updates of the housing benefit subsidy system, but that's a relatively minor point. Um, the final four points on that list are, are standard. There's nothing in there that's out, outside of kind of the ordinary that you'd see in an audit findings report. So at this point, we are not aware of any issues that will cause any further delays. We are envisaging uh, being in a position to sign in the next week, um, sort of well ahead of the deadline at the end of the month. The appendices of the report do then go on to detail recommendations we've raised both this year and last, uh, and further information in relation to the adjustments that have been identified. This includes all adjustments that are above our clearly trivial threshold of £50,000. Um, it also includes our proposed audit opinion and the letter of representation that we're requesting the management sign and, and return to us. Um, it is also worth just quickly saying at this point that we'd originally proposed an audit fee of about £61,500 for the audit due to the additional work we've had to do on the valuations of the properties um, and on that issue around the actuarial work we are expecting that we'll have to increase that and we are also going to have to consider um, potential additional fees in relation to kind of 
inefficiencies caused from changes within sort of key members of the finance team. So Joe has done a great job, uh, but there has definitely been a bit of a learning curve that has had an impact. Um, that was all I was planning to say. Um, we would like to put on record our thanks to Stefan and Joe and, and the finance team, um, because as usual, it has been a relatively small, smooth process. So anybody have any questions? Thank you for that. Um, I'll now open it up to any questions. Mr. Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is not a popper yourself or anybody. Uh, it's a genuine, genuine question. Why am I here this evening for this report? I don't know what my role is in this. There's no exact summary, no guidance of what my role is in this, what recommendations I'm supposed to move and what move. It's just an audit report that's just been put in front of me. I spent the weekend pulling it apart, putting it back together, and I still don't understand my role in this committee because without an exact summary to understand what I'm being sought from me, I don't understand my role here this evening. I was hoping somebody could define it. You want to step in? It, I mean, this is the, the process that we go through every year. Um, but what we've, we've put on the agenda on item four on the, the, the main page is that um, the, the uh, committee or recommend to the committee that they approve the audit findings report of the external auditors and the management representation letter. So that's the, the, the key uh, recommendation, if you like. Thank you, Chair. Follow up, Mr. Chairman, with your permission. Yeah, if I've, if the enough of us vote against this this evening, what happens? So I, I mean, fundamentally, it would depend on why, um, but it would, it, at the very least, would cause some delays in the process, um, and. If, if there was a significant reason behind it, then potentially further audit work and, and further findings. No, I'm still going to ask what's the effect on the authority of the delay? Is there any serious effect on the authority? But basically, I'm asking if you have a choice if I'm sorry or not. Um, so from our point of view, um, this report is effectively for your assurance. It's setting out what we have done and, and the findings that we have uh, that have resulted from the work that we have done, and it's for you to then take into consideration when you are approving the financial statements. Um, so, if you were to raise something that resulted in us having to do more work, then there would there would be a delay. There would then be additional fees for the additional work and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but fundamentally, the the purpose of the report is to give you assurance that the financial statements are reasonable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is one further uh, issue, I suppose, is that there's, there's a statutory deadline uh, set out um, under legislation that the accounts need to be approved by the 30th of November uh, this year. It's, it's been earlier in previous years. But again, coming back to your point, what, what's the consequence if, the, if, if that doesn't happen? The, there isn't really a consequence. It, I, I mean, we know of authorities whose 2021 accounts still haven't been signed off yet. So the, the, you know, it's, I suppose it's, um, it's I, don't think, I don't think it's even a black mark against the authority, to be honest, anymore because of the, the delays under COVID. Thank you, Chair. So it's a bit like decent home standard. If you didn't meet it by 2010, you're in serious trouble. When Birmingham and Liverpool didn't and said to the government, what are you going to do if we don't? The government went, we never thought of that. <laughs> Just the reason for my question, Chair, I just sometimes get very uncomfortable with uh, reports with no exact summary, with no recommendations I can directly scrutinise that almost takes me down the point of you ain't got a choice but to vote for this, and I'm always uncomfortable when I find myself in that position. Uh, well, I do actually concur there that it, it, as an audit and scrutiny committee, it is right that we should have a summary and we should know what we're, what we're talking about. But I do think that um, the guys from Grant Thornton and, and as particularly the financial team over the last four meetings that I've chaired have been very frank and honest of saying we are checking and audit all the financial and that's what's brought up the anomalies really is that you know some of the benchmarks have moved up or down uh, and we've picked up on that and yes there's been a slight delay that there's a couple of items that's not just concluded right now uh, but it is 99 percent there now 
um, and there's nothing that's going to really affect, if you look at the, the balance sheets and, and, and the numbers in, in, in the various columns of the accounts, it's not a great shake, so uh, a big issue, to be, to be perfectly honest. I've, I've read the report, I've looked at the balance sheets, and I'm thinking, you know, it might be 1% there and, and a small, okay, pound notes, it's quite a big number, £400,000, but it's not on the, on the greater scheme of things. So, you know, I, I would like to, you know, just reassure everybody that it is a good report, it's been done properly and with integrity, and these guys are professionals, and that's why we picked it up. It would be rude, or should we say wrong, if all that work from January had been done and those anomalies hadn't been picked up. I would be more concerned then. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, reassured there, thank you. Uh, having done that, um, can I give our officers some praise and actually defend our officers on my next point? I'm going everywhere tonight, Steph. <laughs> Uh, page four, uh, I think, is a wonderful statement. Did not find any significant difficulties during audit, I think, is a real testament to our officers and the work they do all year. So certainly thank you very much for that. And page 23, see, I have read it. I actually fundamentally disagree with the statement on page 23, and I fundamentally disagree with it because, I, you know, I think it's fundamentally wrong. Um, apparently, it's been stated that the officers have not done enough to report COVID expenditure uh, separately to members. As a member of this authority, I can fundamentally tell you our officers were keeping members regularly updated with COVID spending and that what you spend on, whether it was grants, whether it was additional burdens on this council. I'm incredibly comfortable sitting so I was fundamentally aware of what COVID spending was taking place and where grants came and where grants went out. I, I just fundamentally disagree with that statement. I'll just look if I get an answer on that. Uh, so that's that's not the point we're making. That's not what we're trying to say. Um, so the point we're making is that um, when sort of presenting that management information during the year, um, it, the, the, the main sort of INE statement within that information is set out in a particular way. Um, and the requirement of the uh, code of practice that the accounts prepared under is that that is then reflected in the presentation of the primary financial statements. And there is a minor discrepancy in how those are presented. And that discrepancy is in relation to the presentation of COVID um, expenditure. So it, it is just a disclosure point that that presentation is not consistent. We're not, it's not a comment on, on the reporting during fact. the year. It's just a fact. Yeah. Well. So, sorry, sorry can I have that again? Because I, I didn't understand because the statement clearly says members were not updated on COVID expenditure. Now, in plain English, that says to me members were not given the information at the right time, which I fundamentally actually disagree with because I felt very comfortable the information was gained. This is actually a statement that could stop me voting for this. So I, yes, so I can, looking at it with what you've just said, I can see how that, yes, that is an interpretation of what it says. That's not the interpretation it was in. That was not what we were trying to say. Um, can, can I, can I, sorry. Um, this is an issue that we had last year as well. And if you read the management response that we've put, Put forward we don't agree with it either we've we've uh, highlighted covid spend and income uh, on on the, the the face of the main financial statement within the accounts to, to for the reader of the accounts to see this is ex, uh, exceptional expenditure we've spent on covid and being reimbursed uh, through government grants and whatever as well our view was it's exceptional it shouldn't be sort of lost if you like within the the normal reporting structure of the council. So the, the point the external auditors are making is the format of our reporting is by assistant director and executive director, which we report during the year. Um, but when we've come to do the accounts, we've done that, but then we've pulled out the COVID expenditure separately, which during the year we, we sort of lumped in with the assistant director spend. Is, is the point the, the auditors make? Now we did, we don't agree with that, so we we've, we've we've sort of you know, we've, we've we've not changed the accounts for it. It's not a major issue uh, in terms of the audit, or um, but it, it is a non-compliance with the code. So if you're reading the letter of the law in the code, um, in the auditor's view, sorry, it's a non-compliance. In our view, we've we, we're within our rights to to report what we like uh, within our accounts, but the auditors do have to. Uh, check what we've done and compare that to the code so that they're, they're bound to uh, 
uh, raise that and bring that to your attention so you're aware of that. Mm. As I say, we're completely happy. I know we're completely happy we've done it right. Um, but in terms of the letter of the code, we've got a disagreement in terms of the, uh, the treatment of the COVID spend and income. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I still not accepting that, Mr. Chairman. It clearly states members were not kept updated. The wording of it is fundamentally flawed. I sit here as a member. It was buried in quarterly performance reports, regular updates from accounts, regular meetings with assistant directors, regular meetings at scrutiny. Uh, we had um, you know COVID working groups, cabinet working groups. The amount of times we were updated on exactly where this money was coming in, exactly where it was going, where it sat, what directory it was with. Members could not have been more informed of this. I fundamentally object to the wording. I want it reworded, Mr. Chairman, please. Right, okay, Scott. Um, I do take your point. Um, if it is terminology, which I think it is more than, uh, you know, substance, audits, if you could just change it, then we'll, um, we'll, we'll move forward. Uh, and it's again, I would like to concur that I'm sure that audit did the right job there. They've picked up on something. So it has been, you know, <laughs> audit is audit. <laughs> Cook. I've generally just got one more question, Mr. Chairman, and I've not got any preconceived agenda on this one. I just want to understand it a little bit more. Obviously, on page 21, uh, Council should consider if its de depreciation policy is appropriate. I just wondered if we had any more thoughts on that, and there's no agenda there for me whatsoever. I just want to understand it a little bit more. Well, I think that, that's a fair point, to be honest. I've been depreciation a lot. Yeah, well, yeah. So this, this is one that's just come out of the fact that we, one of our kind of standard reviews is we look through the asset register and we see how many assets there are that are fully depreciated um, uh, because it's not uncommon for those to no longer be within the ownership of an audited body. So we sort of pick a sample and we check whether, whether the, the council can evidence that those things are still owned and still used. Um, so that's not an issue at, at this council. We've, we've done that test. We're happy that there's no indication that those assets shouldn't be in the asset register anymore. But there are there's a significant value of assets that are sitting there at nil in the balance sheet. Um, and so it's just it's just the question um, that we think it's something that should be considered. Should they have been depreciated over a longer period? Um, it's not a huge issue, as, as you can see in the report, we've put it in a kind of a low priority recommendation. I'm and if, if it's considered and the answer is no, we're happy, it's fine, then that's, that's perfectly appropriate. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, this is just a quick clarification. I'm hoping it's a typo and not a serious problem. Obviously, on page 12 of the report we've got here, it says 241.9 million council dwellings after the adjustment. If you look on the exact summary of the next report, which is statements of accounts, it says 242.9 million. So there's a million pound difference. I just wondered, do we want to quickly tidy up? I'm assuming it's a typo, Steph. Like I said, I've, I've done these reports to death over the weekend, so I really did pick up a few things. But that was just one of them, just I think it needs clarifying. And just to say, as I say at every meeting, our council houses are worth zero with a sitting tenant. So this line always really makes me chuckle. Thank you for that. Uh, and I'd just like to bring up on the, on the assets. Uh, part of the work that we're talking about now is actually uh, a full asset register valuation and strategy with the asset team. We are, you know, it's a piece of work that we're looking into doing and, and going forward that, so that there's a strategy for every asset in the town that belongs to us and what we're doing with it. So it will be taken great care going forward. Right, so that gives me pleasure now to recommend that the findings of the report and the management, well, findings of this report, really. And the management representation letter yeah, approved. Yeah, yeah, and the management representation letter. That's a given. Your, 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 your amendment has been noted, so I now move. Okay. And show of hands. Thank you. Next item is the Code of Conduct Review. 
No, John, I'm going to jump one out, haven't I? Yeah, it's the, the annual statement of the council reports. Yep, thank you, Chair. I, I feel we've we've already touched on um, a, a lot of this already, but uh, I'll give you a, a quick overview. So, preparation of the statement of accounts is the is the combination of months of work by the finance team, which started with initial planning meeting uh, with external auditors and an accounts preparation workshop in February, followed by monthly updates from April through to July with the audit team, and then weekly meetings during the audit. Uh, I do have to say the, the hard work of the finance team in, in the preparation of the main financial statements and the associated notes, but the draft accounts uh, were completed before the audit started at the end of July, uh, when they were issued to the external auditor, to the members of this committee, and they were published on the council's website before the 31st of July statutory deadline to publish the draft accounts. Uh, and, and as, as Laureline has, has stated, that's uh, in the face of we did have some staffing vacancies at the time as well, so it's quite an, an achievement. Uh, the audit commenced in July, and it is, as, as uh, Laureline has said, it's expected to be completed hopefully this week. Uh, it's been previously reported to members that as a result of needing to close the accounts earlier and sometimes rely on estimates in doing so, it's more likely there'll be changes uh, to the draft accounts before they're finalised. This is the case this year, as we've already talked about. Uh, although it's not a material uh, change because it's less than our £1 million materiality limit, we've changed the figures for the housing valuation since the valuer's initial report in April following a comprehensive review review by the, the value, valuers um, during the audit process because of the issues identified by the auditors. So that has increased the value of housing dwellings on the balance sheet by £558,000 to 200, yes, it is £241.9 million, that's a typo in the report, <laughs> uh, with the associated changes to the comprehensive income and expenditure account movement and reserve statement and the associated notes. Um, there have been some other, a number of other amendments to the accounts uh, discussed and agreed with uh, the auditors and their action within that final uh, audited uh, statement of accounts subject to the audit being completed, which are attached to Appendix 1. It's important to note that other than that housing dwellings valuation, they are sort of minor presentational disclosure issues and haven't changed the overall figures within the main financial statements or notes and haven't impacted on general fund balances, actuary balances or the collection fund balances. Regulations do require that the chair of this committee uh, sign and date the statement of accounts with the attention that the, the chair's signature formally represents the completion of the council's approval process for the accounts. However, as Laurelin has explained, they've con while the auditors have concluded the vast majority of, the, of their work, uh, they've still got a bit more to do this week, so the opinion is not yet available pending completion of that work. So for this reason, it's, it's proposed to delegate authority to the chair to approve any changes, we're not anticipating that there will be any, and re-sign the accounts if necessary <laughs> once the work is complete and the audit can be concluded. Uh, if there are any changes, we'll, we'll let the committee know as soon as we can. Uh, so we're still asking members to approve the accounts tonight. Uh, and it's worth noting, and I put it in the report, the external audit team and the finance team, they've faced significantly higher assurance and information demands arising from increased requirements by the audit regulator this year. So I think that's contributed to uh, the additional workload as well. And finally, can I thank the audit team for their hard work uh, and for all but finalising the audit this week, but definitely, hopefully, be before the, the statutory deadline of the 30th of November. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you for that. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, our previous conversation this afternoon, um, you know, I'm quite happy, having spoken to you guys, to take that responsibility and sign the accounts off, I am assured and I'm confident that the little bits of work that's left are in hand and will be closed off within two weeks. So I'd like to reassure the committee it is in good order, the work has been done and, uh, you know, as I alluded to earlier, 
the audit bar has been raised, which has caused the extra work, and which is great really, because audit is, always needs to be raised again. We need to be better than we was last year. So uh, I'll open it to... Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, obviously, the statement of accounts is a statement of fact. I've got no objection to the facts figures anywhere in here. I've got a couple of points I'd like to make, but obviously I will support supporting this report. That's not a problem. Um, firstly, um, if we look on page 18, and this is not really a material issue, it's just a personal piece of feeling. You've got non-financial performance. In February 2019, council approved the council's corporate plan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Come a bit further down. However, it became evident that the plans, processes, and strategies uh, that have guided the organization were due to be renewed. Uh, this was brought together, sorry, a new vision uh, for the next three years for 22 to 25 was approved by council on February 2022. This brought together by councillors during a number of councillor-led workshops. Well, that's rubbish to start with. Um, having been part of that building process, I can tell you a lot of councillors were cut out of that process because they were not members of the controlling group. So that's a dubious statement to start with. Um, it was required to review and refresh and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the vision is set out here to a degree where it says Tamworth celebrating our heritage, creating a better future. In order to achieve the vision, we have developed a new corporate plan, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, on the 27th of October, at the state of the borough debate, I moved a motion that the corporate plan was put into review due to the fact that as we've come out of COVID and obviously the economy currently collapsing, not a single mention of the word vulnerable, homelessness, um, mental health or voluntary sector. Given the statements of society at the minute, I moved a motion that it needed urgent review, that the evidence officers were tasked to go away, create a real evidence base of the real issues in Tamworth and wider society so we could review if that corporate plan was correct. Yeah, I read it this evening like it's still a to complete. I think we need to fundamentally change the wording in this report to say it is under review because I will hold to the fact that that motion was carried unanimously at full council that our corporate priorities are currently under review. So when this statement comes before me this evening saying it's still a fate to complete, I can't sit here and stomach that because at the minute we've got a, a vision that concentrates on things like economy and job creation while people in society are seriously suffering. We need to establish in this report that it is under review and I'd like that amendment made, Mr Chairman, if you don't mind. Councillor Ford. Just on a point of that, this is for years 21, 22, so it would look up to uh, April 22, and the, the, the amendment was moved in October. I mean, I'm assuming it'll be focused in. Which bit? A specific bit. Uh, the new vision, uh, which has now got the corporate plan in place. Yeah, the, the new vision, I'm which was approved, it, it approved in February, uh, and this was signed off. These are the accounts for up to April 22. So I take your point, 100% that we, you did move the amendment and it got approved. However, I don't think it's relevant to include that amendment tonight because it's for last year's accounts. Uh, withdraw my earlier comment, Mr Chairman. I'll be voting against this report tonight. Any more questions? Right. Um, well, I listen to what you say. I do take it on board. But uh, I think... Uh, Councillor Ford, you, you are right. These, these are retrospective a year ago accounts. Um, yes, there's lots of post-COVID um, regeneration, rework, and, and it will be constantly reviewed. But for these, I think they are a fact and time has moved on. Uh, and therefore, I now want to move these forward for the account to be signed and approved tonight. Thank you for that. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, back in 2019, a report from the Committee of Standards and Public Life made a number of recommendations in relation to the form and content of codes of conduct for member behaviour. And partially in response to this report, the LDA commissioned a new model code of conduct and identified um, and some uh, commissioned a new code of conduct, including guidance on its application. 
we brought a report back to committee in June 2022 um, and in response to that report a briefing was held in August uh, for all members to provide an overview of some of these differences um, identified and I've summarised those in Appendix A in this report. The LGA medal code doesn't differ significantly uh, in content from the local code already in operation and there is no legal requirement from the current code to be replaced or for the council to adopt the new LGA model. There are some uh, potential positives in the new LGA uh, model code and these could potentially be added. Um, the current code of conduct and procedure for dealing with the complaints was reviewed and endorsed in 2014 and in line with corporate guidance and to ensure it remains fit for purpose, um, we ask members today to endorse the LJ model code and review the current code of conduct and the procedures for making a complaint, um, including member input um, with a review code presented back to this committee at a future date. And, uh, thank you, Chair. Happy to second any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Apologies, Mr Chairman. I wasn't coming in tonight to be del deliberately problematic, and uh, I suspect Nicky, unfortunately, knows where I'm going to go with this. Um, as, as we say, with the agenda we've had this evening, it was important work, but it was hard reading. You know, if you're not a professional auditor or a professional accountant, it's hard reading. Then you do your research online, you figure out some of these terms like, you know, maternality mean, and et cetera, et cetera. I spent all weekend, Monday and this morning, absolutely pulling apart the first two reports. Hence, I spotted the typo between the two. I really put my heart and soul into it which means I didn't really get to this report until this afternoon. And I was sat, I'll be honest, I was sat at my desk at work in my lunch hour, opened it up to go through it. And the, it's a public report. This report is open to Tamworth public. The links in it didn't work unless you went through our internal ModGov system. And I've discovered that after the public website asked me for a password. So if I'm a member of the public that can't access our ModGov system, how could I have read this report? Now, I believe under the Access Information Regulations 2012, we're in breach. It's only a small breach, but I believe we're in breach. Uh, I'm already taking the matter up with the Ombudsman, which makes me incredibly uncomfortable this evening voting for this report when we've denied access to the public to the meat of the report. Now, what really did shock me on the back of that was that then, after I'd raised this with IT and the Chief Executive, at 10 to 5 this evening, an email went out from Democratic Services saying the following document has been published as a, as a follow item. It was never to follow item. I, I, I get that's probably our IT system that does that, but it was never a to follow item. That's us correct, correcting an error we had in releasing information to the public. That is an actual misleading email. I'm incredibly uncomfortable with this report tonight, Mr Chairman, and I, I can't support it in its current guise because we have not followed for, uh, access to information regulation 2012. I, I'm not saying the public's report any problems, or even that the public wanted to read it. But we have a responsibility as a council. We shouldn't, when we say we're transparent, put an asterisk next to it that says unless we make an IT error. I'm uncomfortable taking this report this evening until the public have had full sight of it, whether they wanted it or not. We've got the, we have to ensure as an open authority under transparency and access to information regulations under the Local Government Act that we have that transparency. It took me three hours this afternoon to get access to this report and I'm a councillor because I weren't on my own PC, I was at work at the time. It makes me incredibly uncomfortable. I think we're a better council than that. Can I ask that this be held over until we can do this properly? Please, Mr Chairman. Councillor Cook, um, I actually do concur with you there that this is an audit committee and IT mistakes, whatever, they do happen occasionally. So, I don't think anybody's going to do it. No, I, I, you know, that's not, not our meaning, but you're right. We, because we couldn't get on today, it has caused an issue for us to sign it up. So I would like to move it to the next meeting in, is it February? So we'll review this in February and by then we should be all ready to approve it and move it forward. And just one more point, Mr Chairman. Obviously, I'd like to see some public consultation on this as well, because obviously our standards need to be held up to public accountability. So some sort of public consultation around this would be wonderful as well when we get round to it. Point for this evening, I don't think that's another question. I'm just putting it out there. Well, as you've raised it, public consultation, then can you bring details to this committee of what you really want on I'm that. I'm happy to circulate and obviously include... Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, if, you know... What, what I would like to see. If that's not going to make decisions, just what I... No, no, no. We, we, we can bounce it around up line and get somewhere, yeah. You've mentioned it, so let's talk it openly yeah. and let's move forward with clarity. Okay. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you.
Uh, I don't know if you've downloaded that revised timetable or you've got it in front of you. Um, as you can see, in February, it's going to be uh, another busy, uh, busy meeting. Um, there is nothing that's untoward out there. The reports will be flowing. We will get through them uh, and we'll keep them as brief as possible. Uh, I think this, uh, you know, the audit of the accounts side will be pretty much ticked off. Um, you know, there will be an, uh, an auditor's annual report, so we'll just keep your eyes on that. Uh, the internal audit quarterly update. Uh, Andrew will be um, responsible, and I suppose presenting that on, on, on then. Uh, and it's our quarterly risk assessment report, which again is is, is crucial for how we move forward. Uh, particularly in the new year, after all the new financial and whatever comes out of number 11 in the next week or two. Uh, so that, that's all good. Um, we've also got uh, the audit committee effectiveness. Now that's quite keen for me to say, you know, how effective is this committee? How are we going forward? What are we doing? Uh, you know, and how can we improve? So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, along with the... Uh, you know, review of the consultation and the systems and delegation of officers. Again, are we doing the right things and are we delegating to the right people with the right methods and policies and procedures? That's that's all good to me. Uh, and uh, again, I think that following this year's um, financial review, uh, we've got one in February that, um, you know, is the guidance now of how we're going forward. So I think we could all be a little bit wiser on, you know, what is the financial guidance for the for TBC and, you know, the way we go forward. <laughs> um, and then the next item is obviously what we're going to talk about next, to be honest. Have the Code of Conduct uh, Oh yes, the Code of Conduct, we moved to that one now. I've just written that down. May I move under the Local Government Act 1972, the exclusion of the press and public for purpose of this meeting, where the information might not have... Blah, 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 blah. Sorry. Happy to move. 